You remember the dog. Hi right, guys. It is an absolutely spectacularly gorgeous. I am talking about a seriously over the top beautiful day here in the collapse of everything here on the uh, the strangely named Good Friday. I've never really understood uh, that name, Good Friday. I think we should talk to Jesus about how good that Friday was. But anyway, that would be Friday. Where are we? March 29th, 2024. And uh, since it is our holiday Easter weekend, I have, I guess I have two gigs this weekend with my band Morally Flexible. We have two gigs this weekend that I got to get ready for to go play acoustic music with my friends to entertain the masses. Yes, uh, but before I get into all of that, uh, since it is Friday, and it is your good luck Friday. Why don't you sit over here? Oh, I think there's room for both of us. It is time for our ain't gonna happen. Uh, our ain't gonna happen. AGH Friday roundup. And uh, just in, in no particular order, uh, before we dive in, to the Good Friday mainstream media. Let's just look over here. Let's look at a couple from medium.com. This one by this fellow, Ron Miller, in the understatement of the year. Degrowth. Degrowth won't be easy, but it is oh so necessary. There you go. It, the, it's not that degrowth won't be easy, it's that degrowth ain't going to happen. Well, I, I, okay, I need to <laughs> understand that degrowth most certainly is going to happen. It needs to happen, uh, and it won't be easy, uh, but it is going to happen. But obviously it is not going to happen voluntarily uh, <laughs> there is the, the last thing that's going to happen is voluntary degrowth uh, let's see uh, <laughs> it, 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 you know I, I don't know where, where where to launch into this. This could easily become its own separate rant. Just a little bit uh, of this article from Ron Miller. For many environmentalists, degrowth is not so much a problem to overcome as an absolutely necessary response to ecological overshoot and for years they have called for a deliberate, voluntary reduction in economic and demographic, meaning population expansion. The plain fact is that on a finite planet, we cannot keep growing, either in numbers or in economic activity. We have known since the publication of the Limits to Growth in 1972 that the modern economy is on a collision course with ecological ruin. If we do not make the bold leap of revising our worldview, if we don't rein in, meaning voluntarily rein in, our mad rush for more of everything, starting with more babies, we face catastrophic system collapse. We can either choose degrowth, uh-huh, and manage it consciously, or fall into it 
kicking and screaming. Yes. <clears throat> we must start by questioning our dominant worldview. Communities and economies that are structured around an infinitely expanding workforce and unlimited consumption will need to radically rethink their basic assumptions. Conventional economics will need to yield to new approaches such as steady state theory and ecological economics. <laughs> How do you like that one for a an oxymoron, ecological economics, but uh, dream on, brother. Dream on, uh, or should I say, dream on? My new, my new word I want to get introduced out here in the doomosphere is dreamers. Dreamers, kind of the same thing as apocalyptic. These are doomers. Uh, who, who still dream uh, of this shit that ain't gonna happen. Degrowth. Yeah, right. Well, voluntary degrowth. But, uh, let's check in with my favorite uh, dreamer of all on Medium, Will Lockett. What is on Will's... <coughs> played here on Good Friday today. This laser, this laser could unlock fusion energy, but not in the way you think. Blah, blah, blah. I have said it a million times, but fusion power really could revolutionize the world. It could give us near limitless, affordable, on tap energy with only helium as a byproduct. But this utopian technology is currently far out of reach. Damn it, our reactors still use more energy to create fusion than they produce from fusion, which is not an ideal setup if you are trying to produce energy. However, however, UK-based Tokamak Energy is currently testing a laser, a magic laser beam that could unlock fusion power by solving one of the most significant flaws in our reactors. Yes. <coughs> okay, we're going to move along from medium.com. This is what's showing up on uh, the uh, Good Friday news feed. Oil giants plan to bury massive amounts of CO2 in Southeast Asia. Yes. Just as they first ventured to do over a century ago, the world's largest oil companies are staking their claims far from home. This time, to swallow rather than spew planet warming industrial emissions. Carbon dioxide storage is emerging as a potential multi-billion dollar revenue stream for firms like Exxon, Mobil, Shell, and Chevron. Yes, which are under global pressure to rein in the unfettered burning of fossil fuels. Yes, in Asia, which will generate the majority of this century's carbon emissions, Indonesia and Malaysia are among the few places where CO2, once captured, can be viably stored underground. Yes. With the cash, decades of experience injecting carbon for the purpose of pumping out extra oil and an increasing number of depleted wells that can be refilled, oil companies are already jockeying for position. 
Yes. I love hearing from Exxon Mobile Chief Executive Officer Darren Woods, quote, world scale problems like climate change need world scale companies to help solve them. You know, I don't even know what is the proper uh, uh, analogy to this. This is beyond the fox guarding the hen house. Uh, this is beyond, what's it called, the Hegelian, uh, what's that called, the, uh, not the Hegelian dialect, but, 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 but anyway, you, you know, those who created the problems are going to create the solution. Uh, <laughs> it, it is Exxon Mobil, uh, the world-class company Exxon Mobil, that is going to save the planet from the problem they created by opening up this new can of worms. What this is all about, guys, in case you haven't figured this out, that uh, it, it, it's these guys are going to make billions and billions if not trillions of dollars uh, 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 off of this absolutely preposterous ain't gonna happen scheme uh, this, it, 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 this is the, the depths of, of, of irony is chicanery uh, the proper word that, that I'm looking for here uh, I, 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 I mean, it's, it's <laughs> this one, to untangle this particular bright green lie uh, uh, of carbon uh, capture and storage, it's all about the oil companies making money. Now, that is going to happen. All right. The oil companies are going to make a shitload of money off of this, but what ain't going to happen, it's not going to do a goddamn thing to save this planet. And it's just going to give them uh, more and more license to go right on doing what they're doing. Anyway, what's going on over there in China? PetroChina lifts green ambitions as big oil softens pledges. Yes. Fresh from posting record profits from drilling crude and pumping gas, China's biggest oil company has promised, <clears throat> has promised that all of its output will be fueled by renewables come 20 33. By that date, quote, all drilling and refining activities will be powered by clean energy. Petro China Company Chairman Dai Hulang, uh, blah, blah, blah. That's a 17 year advance on the company's earlier pledge to hit that target by 2050. Yes, and stands in stark contrast to some Western oil majors, which are walking back their clean energy ambitions as fossil fuels continue to drive their profits. Of course, of course, using solar and wind to produce fossil fuels will not make much of a dent in China's climate goals when set against the impact of burning all that oil and gas to power cars and factories. Do you think so? And, uh, <laughs> guys, uh, did you see that giant, uh, that giant solar farm? down in uh, the great state of Texas that got the shit kicked out of it uh, by that big hailstorm. Many stories on this. Hail cripples massive solar farm sparking resident 
concerns about vulnerable green tech. An onslaught of hail in southeastern Texas that destroyed large portions of a massive solar farm is highlighting the perils of trading traditional power sources for vulnerable green alternatives and sparking concern about the potential for chemical leaks from the broken panels. <laughs> there, there, there's just something about seeing that uh, giant field of hundreds and hundreds uh, of these uh, solar panels uh, reduced to a pile of worthless rubble <coughs> because of a 10-minute hailstorm. And, and the hail wasn't even that big. It, it's not like we're talking uh, fucking grapefruit-sized hail. You, you know, I'm, I'm thinking it was just, you know, the size of hail. Anyway, from solar panels getting the shit kicked out of them in a hailstorm. All right, to this opinion piece uh, by don't know who Robin Gaster is, the Director of Research for the Information Technology and Innovation Foundation Center for Clean Energy <coughs> in Innovation, a visiting scholar at George Washington University. So what's on Robin Gaster's mind today? Let's be realistic about green hydrogen like any new technology, green hydrogen must meet three related challenges, production, distribution, and of course adoption, but it faces far higher than advertised hurdles at every stage. Green hydrogen has been touted as the Swiss army knife the Swiss army knife of clean energy. It generates no greenhouse gas emissions because it is made by applying green electricity to water to create hydrogen and oxygen. <coughs> this is in contrast to blue hydrogen and gray hydrogen. <coughs> so green hydrogen boosters claim it can serve as a versatile tool for decarbonizing hard-to-reach sectors like steel, cement, trucks, and aviation. Unfortunately, that is simply not the case. Like any new technology, green hydrogen must meet, you know, um, all of this stuff. And then uh, Robin Gaster breaks it down uh, why this bright green lie, the bright green hydrogen lie, is such a uh, is such a joke. I think my geraniums need water. All right, what's going on in the? giant sunshade news of the week. It's, it's like every week uh, they're coming up with a new giant sunshade to save the planet. Okay, what is the latest giant sunshade? A variety of methods are being considered. Uh, I'm sorry. Across the globe, scientists from various fields are researching ways to reveal to reverse global climate change. A variety of methods are being considered, including adding sulfate aerosols to the stratosphere. Can you say, you know, chemtrails? <clears throat> but the Planetary Sunshade Foundation, the Planetary Sunshade Foundation is promoting the deployment of a large sunshade in space that would temporarily block solar radiation and cool the Earth. 
Would something like that work, though? Uh, all right, Elliot, we have another professor of mathematics, Dr. Nicholas Solomy, professor of mathematics, statistics, and physics at Wichita State University's Fairmount College, uh, is digging deep. Uh, so... She's looking at three questions. How big does this thing have to be? How fast will it work? And what is the effectiveness of a sunshade with no other changes in carbon dioxide emissions? Okay. Dr. Solomy and Kabler determined that for the planetary sunshine, sunshade to be effective, the sunshade would need to be 900 miles wide. So we got, it only gives the one dimension, 900 miles. Uh, and it, nowhere in the article does it give the other dimension because, you know, 900 miles wide. Uh... <laughs> Uh, and I guess once they get this 900 mile wide, who the hell knows how uh, how tall or uh, how high, you know what I'm saying. Uh, I don't know if it's 900 miles by 900 miles, and it looks like, would, according to her back of the envelope calculations, uh, would take 12 to 15 years. Quote, the final answer really was that a sunshade is not totally plausible as the sole mechanism for slowing down climate change. Huh. There would have to be other things that come into play to help. Do you think so? Dr. Keebler. Okay. We have all heard about how indoor farms, indoor farms are going to both uh, feed 8 billion people and save the planet at the same time, but the Washington Post is questioning that bright green lie. Indoor farms are remaking the produce market at a cost to the planet. No one would argue that the climate in North Texas is ideal for growing lettuce, a crop that thrives when there is a chill in the air, but the region's broiling summers are of no concern to Eddie Badrina, chief executive of the Eden Green Technology, a vertical hydroponic greenhouse company just outside of Dallas, uh, this thing, uh, <laughs> uh, but what it's all about, uh, you know, about, about taking complete control of every last aspect of growing a head of lettuce to feed the planet, uh, but all that control comes with environmental cost. Inside these facilities, farmers are creating the perfect conditions with power generated mostly by burning fossil fuels and lots of it. And don't forget there is extraordinary water. Uh, you see, you, you, so it's also, it, it, it's the water in the fossil fuels. Anyway, but as long as we're all uh, at the eating, at, at the uh, vertically grown planet saving salad bar, uh, don't forget 
that a plant, now th this is not saying you have to be vegan, okay. If you're not ready to take the full vegan plunge to save the planet, you can save part of the planet, I guess. Uh, you can be a partial vegan and save part of the planet. Plant heavy flexitarian diet. The flexitarian diet uh, could help limit global heating. A global shift to a mostly plant based flexitarian diet. Yes, could reduce greenhouse gas emissions and help restrict global heating to one and a half degrees C, a new study shows. Yes, previous research has warned how emissions from food alone at current rates will propel the world past this key international target. Yes, but the new research shows how that could be prevented by widespread adoption of a flexitarian diet built around reducing meat consumption and adding more plant-based foods. Yes. Okay, what do we have? Two more. Speaking of flexitarian, we're going to go from flexi to flippy. We're going to uh, talk about how Flippy the Whale, Flippy the Whale, is going to teach the little, uh, the, the, the little planet nibbling bundles of joy in Staunton, I don't even know what state Staunton uh, is, but Flippy the Whale is coming to teach the little uh, the little planet nibbling bundles of joy about ocean plastic pollution. Yes, um, globally about two million plastic bags are used every minute with an average total time use of 12 minutes and about one million plastic bottles are purchased every minute, but only about 9% of this plastic is recycled. The rest break down into microplastics in the environment. The massive amounts of plastic pollution we create injure and kill wildlife. Yes, this is Katherine Sheridan, co-founder for Shenandoah Green's Earth Day. Quote, we cannot recycle our way out of this problem. The only solution, the only solution is to stop the continuing flood of plastic being pumped out by the oil industry. Close quote. And towards those end, Shenandoah Green's life-size whale sculpture, Flippy the Whale, Flippy the Whale, is featured in this year's logo saying, Stop the plastic tidal wave. Yes, Flippy the Whale is the mascot for this year's Earth Day. You go, Flippy. You go, Flippy the Whale. Right, but we're going to close with, we're going to go from flippy to floppy, I guess. Uh, coal, the dirtiest fossil fuel, prepares for a long goodbye. The uh, operative word in this sentence from Bloomberg being long. Yes. <clears throat> More than two years after climate negotiators first attempted to consign coal to history, the dirtiest fossil fuel is having a moment. Thanks, thanks 
to a combination of China's inner energy insecurity pushing Beijing back to trusted power sources plus rising demand in India, the continued fallout from the war in Ukraine, and faltering international programs to wean developing economies off of fossil fuels, coal, coal is proving remarkably resilient. Coal output hit a record last year. More coal was produced in 2023 than any year in human history. And producers are preparing for a future where they will be required for decades to balance renewable energy. Even prices are holding up. Much of this second wind for coal is down to Asia. Uh, in 2000, the International Energy Agency estimated advanced economies accounted for almost half of coal consumption. By 2026, China and India alone will make up more than 70% of uh, the coal consumption on this planet. Uh, those two heavyweights and Indonesia started operating new coal power plants amounting to 59 gigawatts last year and either launched or revived proposals for another 131 gigawatts, about 93% of the world's total. This is Rob Bishop, Chief Executive Offer, Officer of Australian Miner New New Hope Corporation. The New Hope Corporation the name of a coal miner, quote, you look at Asia, the demand and the build out of coal fired power plants, particularly in India, coal is not going anywhere anytime soon. Take it from the new, uh, new uh, uh, hope coal mine chief executive officer in Australia, where Australia is uh, really cranking out, cranking out the coal and sending it to India. But anyway, while there is still some music left on a dying planet, uh, I've got to wrap up. Uh, all of this doom and gloom and uh, busting bright green lies and uh, get out there and uh, track down my buddies in Morally Flexible so we can play some music for the little kitties at the park in Williston, Florida. Get out there and uh, make music while you can, while you still have a planet <clears throat> to make music on. Bye, guys. Are you ready to go make some music, little dog? You can get that lizard like that. Where's that lizard? Get the lizard or not? There's a lizard over there like that. Go get that lizard like that. <laughs>